If you want to support independent content like this show, the PlayStation Podcast Sacred Symbols, the Retro Podcast Knockback, and more, and get perks for doing so, please consider subscribing to Collins Last Stand on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Your support is essential. Thank you. To this day, PlayStation 2 remains the best-selling home video game console of all time. It's the stuff of industry legend. But if you were a day one adopter of the console like I was, you'll probably remember that the Western launch library in October and November of 2000 was well populated, but soft on quality. It wasn't until 2001 that PS2 started housing some real star attractions, and one such early standout was Animusha Warlords, developed and published by Japanese giant Capcom. I remember it well. I was in 11th grade and I had my eyes set on this mysterious samurai game that I thought could deliver something that my PS1 and N64 simply couldn't. In my estimation at the time, Animusha succeeded, synthesizing the horror of Capcom's Resident Evil franchise with a 3D hack and slash formula that had started gaining serious steam the generation before. And it turns out a lot of people agreed with my assessment. Animusha Warlords was a bona fide critical success and one of PS2's earliest commercial hits. Animusha and its weird alternate Japanese history full of demonic forces wouldn't hang around long, though. In fact, it kind of vanished as quickly as it arrived. The fourth game in the core franchise, 2006's Animusha Dawn of Dreams, was the last we heard of the series in any meaningful fashion, and in a way, that made sense. Animusha was originally intended as a trilogy, and that it went any further than three games was perhaps fortunate on its own. And Keiji Inafune, who would later have a major falling out with Capcom, was the series producer and one of its driving forces, so that likely also had something to do with the prolonged silence. But fans of the series' peculiar story, satisfying combat, and RPG light elements, people like me, always harbored a nagging feeling that we wanted more. And now that the original Animusha Warlords has been re-released on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch, we could very well be playing the only extra portion we'll ever get. Then again, maybe it's a harbinger of things to come. Playing through Animusha for the first time since I was a teenager was a nostalgic experience to be sure. It was also fun because of how much it turned out I simply forgot. I recalled much more of how the combat felt than what the details of the story were, and so it was kinda like watching a movie I've definitely seen, but that's been repeatedly overwritten by more recent data. Animusha made its age known time and time again, often in a good way, but sometimes not. I was kind of surprised by how well the game aged graphically, even beyond the enhancements made to this port, and it was funny to be reminded in the end credit scroll that Animusha used extensive motion capture, which represented an enormous technological advancement for our medium. The voice acting is horrendous on the other hand, though that wasn't particularly unusual for the time. In this way, Capcom's re-release Samurai Adventure is a relic from a bygone era that displays both positive and negative attributes in all their unedited glory. It's the perfect encapsulation of something we felt at the time was a quantum leap. Animusha's combat is fun, albeit button mashy and not incredibly sophisticated. You'll spend a lot of time bashing the square button, sometimes in an inexact fashion, as the game lacks an elegant lock-on solution, while performing satisfying flourishes, stabbing enemies' corpses into the ground and collecting their souls in your mystical gauntlet. These souls don't only heal Samonosuke, the protagonist, nor replenish his lost mana. Most importantly, these souls act as a sort of experience point system, one that can be used to upgrade the three different weapons you find throughout the campaign, each attached to a specific element and weapon type. Your lightning sword presents a balance between speed and strength. Your fire broadsword swings slowly but with considerable force. Meanwhile, your wind-imbued staff's quickness is likely more impressive than its punch. All three weapons have a magical spell attached and can also be used to open sealed doors, sealed doors that intertwine themselves into a leveling system, adding a great deal to the game's pacing. Unfortunately, the combat mixes with Animusha's fixed camera angles to create an experience that's more awkward to play than I recall. It's a lot of fun so long as you're patient with the game's archaic design in this regard, one that simply can't be ameliorated by way of an analog-controlled camera. Such a feat would require Animusha to be more deeply reworked and even remade, as opposed to merely tweaked and re-released. But given the limitations of what could apparently be done to Animusha easily and as is, such as presenting the game in widescreen, it's clear our expectations in the early PlayStation 2 era were far different than they are now. That's not necessarily a knock against the game, mind you. It's more a compliment in regard to how far we've come, and how we take lots of essential design philosophies for granted these days. But because of the fixed camera angles and the claustrophobic nature of the game's interior and exterior sets alike, Animusha has an almost jittery feeling when you play it, because the scenes are almost literally constantly changing. It's a shame too, because if you stop moving and just look around, there's a lot of scenery to marvel at. A lot of little, often bloody touches that make the happenings at Inabayama Castle all the more harrowing. Nonetheless, I'd have to imagine that these aged quirks are going to straight up turn some people off, especially younger gamers who grew up with the finer control schemes and cameras we accept as normal in 2019. 
but I didn't find it debilitating so much as jarring at first. You get used to it. Well, I did anyway. If there's one thing that disappointed me about Animusha, it's that it's short, really short, a lot shorter than I remembered it being. Beating the game in under 5 hours, and even in under 4 hours your first time through, shouldn't at all be an issue, though it's a pretty nice one-sitting adventure if you're up for one of those at night or on a weekend. In addition to upgrading your tiny arsenal, there are collectibles to discover, an optional realm to conquer, powerful gear to find, multiple difficulty levels to experiment with, and even a scoring system that assesses your performance at the end of the campaign. In this respect, Animusha's short length is a blessing, because it's a game once beaten that you could see through several more times, not only in pursuit of trophies or achievements, but because the game asks you to play again with a suitable number of options from a generation of gaming where DLC didn't even exist. That said, I'm surprised Capcom didn't pay more attention to extras, like it shoved into some of its other collections and re-releases. The Mega Man and Mega Man X Legacy collections are absolute masterclasses in how ports should be handled in the modern era, with accoutrements galore, new modes, etc. Animusha on current-gen consoles doesn't have any of this. It would have been fun to see concept art, or interviews, or pretty much anything else aside from just the game, and with Capcom being so talented at doing this elsewhere, I was left wondering why this felt more like Konami's Castlevania Requiem, a solid but completely no-frills port. Animusha Warlords was followed by Animusha 2 in 2002 and Animusha 3 in 2004, before the series unceremoniously ended, as mentioned earlier, with 2006's Dawn of Dreams. Is Animusha's re-release a sign of more to come? Is it Capcom testing the waters? Well, they give similar treatment to the other games in the franchise. Could it be that we're on the precipice of a complete series revival? I suppose we'll find out in the years to come. In the meantime, though, it was really nice to play an old classic, an important game from early in PS2's life cycle that's probably not as good as many of us remember, but still plenty of fun in its own right. A nearly 20-year-old Capcom hack and slash from a dormant IP that will hopefully see the light of day again in the not-so-distant future, hopefully with something brand new.